Hello, and thanks for joining our webinar today. My name is Karen Brett, and I am the Events Manager here at ADP. Before we start, I'll explain the interface on your screen. The main window is where the presentation slides are displayed, but you should also have a Q&A box on your screen as well. At the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session where you'll be able to type in any questions you may have for our speakers. We'll be tweeting live throughout the webinar and directly afterwards, and would love you to join the conversation using hashtag ADPWebinar. You can follow us on at ADP underscore UK. Today we are delighted to welcome back Professor Sir Kerry Cooper as our guest speaker. Kerry is Distinguished Professor of Organisational Psychology and Health at Lancaster University Management School. He was knighted in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in June this year for, for services to social sciences. He's recognised as one of the world's leading experts on well-being and stress at work. He's the author of more than 120 books on occupational stress, women at work and industrial and organisational psychology. And if that wasn't enough, this year he's moved from number two to the number one spot in HR Magazine's most influential HR thinker list. Also joining us today is Annabelle Jones, who is ADP's HR Director. A seasoned HR professional with broad experience across all areas of HR, Annabelle joined ADP earlier this year and leads the HR function in the UK, which looks after approximately 800 people. She is also responsible for the development of strategies related to areas such as pay and performance, talent management and corporate social responsibility. So welcome to both of you, Kerry and Annabelle. The data and information used and quoted throughout this webinar has been taken from ADP's Workforce View White Papers, the result of independently commissioned surveys undertaken on behalf of ADP in 2012, 2013 and 14. UK employees from all over the country from a diverse range of industry sectors took part and were asked about the issues that impact them at work. The survey also includes a significant number of HRDs with the aim of gaining deeper insight into their priorities. Throughout the webinar, we'll talk about how some of the results have changed over the last three years, particularly in areas where significant differences were noted, and Kerry and Annabelle will explore these in greater detail. The main findings to emerge from the latest survey will have been optimism levels, the changing rules around shared parental leave, employees' top motivations, the talent gap, and how technology continues to change the way we work. So we'll start with a look at um, optimism levels. I think it's true to say that optimism is definitely on the up and has become the prevailing mood of the UK workforce, with 77% of employees now reporting that they feel optimistic about the decade ahead. This compares to 64% last year and 59% in 2012, so you can see there's a definite positive trend there. Um, if you look at the survey, 35% of employees feel that career opportunities are growing as well, up from 22% last year, although 21% not insignificant, feel that their role could be at risk in the months ahead. Maybe it has something to do with predictability. In 2013, 55% predict the future of work to be unpredictable. In 2014, this is now less than half at 48%. So what do you think, Kerry and Annabelle? It's true that business and economic forecasts look rosier than they have in years, but is it just the improving economy or are there other factors that are contributing to this feeling of optimism? Well, I'm very, I'm very impressed with this. I really think it's very important for uh, UK PLC that this is the case. Optimism is on the increase, but we still have to take cognizance of the fact that one in five people feel their role could be at risk over the next few months. So and, and, and we have to be a bit cautious, but I think it's good news. And the more positive we are and the more optimistic uh, companies are and employees are and employers are, the more business will improve. So I think if, from my perspective, this is, it, this is extremely good news, but, you know, there is still a kind of uh, concern by employees, uh, uh, you know, about their future, and, uh, and, and probably rightly so. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think this is a really good foundation um, to see that the optimism is on the up, and um, as we talk through the details of that and what that means for UK PLC, I think it's a really positive trend, and, and one you'd expect to see is the economy itself starts to recover. I think the only downside here is what's going on in Europe, and we have to be cognizant of that. But other than that, this is great stuff. So moving on to the government's new legislation on shared parental leave, this could have a major impact on how families manage their working lives. Our survey suggests that employers will welcome the new rules, with 21% planning to take advantage of it. And it seems particularly attractive to employees aged between 25 and 34, with 33% of this group aiming to take up the entitlement. Will the legislation help reduce gender inequality? 42% uh, believe so. 
Uh, so while this is all very positive and it's clear that employers will welcome the legislation, you know, is HR ready? Most are, it seems, but 21% of HRD say they are not, and 21% of HRDs also say they don't anticipate a demand for it, especially in the first 12 months, when uh, 70% of HRDs are predicting little or no interest in employees taking advantage of the entitlement. So why do you think there is this disconnect? Well, I suspect that part of the disconnect is, I mean, if you take a look at it, 70% of HRDs predict little or no interest by employees. I think they may be wrong. I think why they're saying that is because jobs are still basically slightly in, insecure. And I think they think that uh, employees, in other words, it, to show commitment, won't want to do flexible working, take up flexible working, or take up shared parental leave as a consequence of that, because it might indicate or indicate to senior management, or at least their line managers, that they're not as committed. So the, I think they're wrong here. I think uh, in terms of uh, shared parental leave, I think uh, that only 21% are prepared or, or anticipated demand, I think, is kind of naive. I think there's going to be a lot more than that, and they better get their act together to deal with this, because this is a big issue. And we can see when we look later on at some of the results that people are really into flexible working and these kinds of... This is not just a benefit, in my view, shared parental leave. I mean, it's in my view, it's really important that we have that for business and for the community at large, because the more we have people uh, engaged with their families, the better it is in the long run for our businesses as well. Uh, I agree on that point. I think from a social perspective, not just a business perspective, it's a really important development. And I think that I um, wonder whether HRDs are basing their views on the additional paternity leave and the low uptake of that. Um, but I think this is structured in a very different way. And with male and female salaries becoming um, more aligned, um, quite often it may be the, the, the female, uh, the mother, um, who is actually earning more. Therefore, financially, there's a, an argument why she would come back to work and the father would take over the the care of the child. So I do think it's, uh, I, I, I would agree with you that I think they've underestimated there how popular this might become. Um, and as for not being ready, well, I think there's um, a lot more information out there now. Uh, so that's still, it's been quite slow to come through. So I think now there's, a, we, we're getting a lot more information coming through about what is actually going to be involved. But I think it's very important that companies are getting their policies and their processes ready to deal with it. Okay, thanks, Annabelle. Um, so if we take a look at employees' motivations now, this year employees have ranked flexible working and the ability to shape their working life as the most important factor for their engagement at 30.4%, which is just ahead of praise and recognition at 30.1%. In contrast, 70% uh, of HRDs rank praise and recognition as number one, followed by fair and open leadership. The ability to work when and where they want is given third place by HRDs. The research also points to an expectation among employees that their organisations will facilitate more flexibility in the next 12 months. Looking at these statistics, it's clear to see that there again is a disconnect between how HRDs and employees feel. It's interesting that flexible working, one of the most dramatic changes to affect our lives in recent years, is being so welcomed by employees, and I guess you know that's for obvious reasons. Employees clearly feel more positively about employers who make it possible for them to work flexibly. But is, you know, so is HR missing out on this huge motivator as it clearly is? You know, what can HR do about that? Well, I think it's uh, really kind of this is interesting news as well. I'm, and I'm, I'm quite pleased to see employers looking at the issue of praise and recognition as a chief motivator because I think that is really quite important. And they also understand the importance of flexibility. From an individual perspective, I guess individuals, you know, two out of every three families are working families. So flexible working is really very important nowadays. And given the new technology, it's inevitable that we can use it to our advantage rather than let it, it control us. So I, 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 don't, I don't think there's a major disconnect here. I, I do think that uh, still remember the employers, 30% of them are saying that, uh, you know, that what, what's important is, is praise and recognition. Uh, and uh, they're roughly the same kind of percentages. But I'm glad that HRDs are concentrating on, on praise and recognition because, to be honest with you, I, I think one of the problems we have with management, uh, uh, line management generally, is they don't have the social skills that they should have 
to understand uh, and value people by uh, not managing by by fault finding, but managing by praise and reward. I think that's really important. And I don't mean reward in money terms. I mean reward in psychological terms. But I, this is a, this is a very interesting. But flexible working, I've been saying for years, is quite a critical phenomenon for us. And uh, we need that flexibility in the workforce, and uh, 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 and that's what employees are saying, and employers are saying the same thing. It's it, yeah, this is an interesting shift um, that I think we wouldn't have seen this so much five years ago. Um, flexible working is really very much up there, not just because of the change in legislation that came about earlier this year. But I just think it's a different mindset now. People want to be able to work where they can, to have more autonomy on how and when they do their work, whether that be from home or on the move. As we have increasingly global companies, people are out and about a lot more. Um, so I do think it's, a, it's just a pattern that we are going to see more and more of. And I think that leads into the technology of how we um, businesses help support that. So it's an interesting trend. What I found interesting in this as well is this business about fair and open leadership. HRD is considering this quite important. We didn't get that from the uh, from the employees so much, and uh, you know the the whole issue of leadership, and we can see it uh, in in every area. We can see it globally in political leadership or the lack thereof uh, throughout the world, really, and uh, we see it in quite a lot of companies. So the issue that HRDs are interested in about leadership, I don't think is a small issue. I think the future requires a different sort of leader, much more socially skilled, much more attuned to people's needs. Uh, and I really, uh, and again, just to reinforce, I'm really pleased to see that they think praise and recognition is a an important motivator because I think it is. And I agree. Okay, so in 2014, employees are very strongly aware of the impact that skills and talent make on their employers' performance and viability. Half see talent gaps as the biggest threat to their organisation, and that is a significant jump from 37% in 2013. Similarly, 46% see a lack of training and employee engagement as contributing to talent gaps. This, recognised as it is by employers as a decisive factor in the um, organisation's performance, suggests the emergence of a talent-driven economy. Also, it looks as though work is being done to um, address the talent challenge with 91% of employees believing they are equipped with the skills and training they need to succeed in their roles. This is up on 85% in 2013 and 78% in 2012. And some employees clearly have an eye to the future, with 36% saying they understand they will need to retrain to keep pace with changes to their role. So in light of all this, what do you see as the crux for the war on, for the war on talent? What does HR need to be doing to affect real solutions to the talent management challenges that are now being faced by their organization? I think the most important thing is this training. I really think that's kind of critical. Uh, and I don't think we invest enough in training. And actually, I think employees were a little bit too optimistic about, you know, 91% of them said they believe they were equipped with the skills and training. But the world is moving so fast. I'd, uh, what they have to do is anticipate what the skills are going to need next year are. Not in five years' time, but next year. And the fact that uh, something like, what was it, 36% of employees understand they need to, to get retrained, only 36%. So nearly 60, whatever it is, uh, 4% still feel that, uh, you know, maybe they won't need that kind of training. I think it's kind of continuous training. I really think uh, that that's fundamental. I guess the really good news for me as well is employees are aware of the talent gap themselves, Right. If you ask HRDs, of course, they're going to say that. They're going to say one of our critical issues, as they have, is, is the talent gap. But for employees to perceive that and increasingly perceive that the people around them who work with them, their colleagues, uh, need to be skilled and up for it, I think is the critical thing. We just need more training, greater budgets and everything else, and we need individuals to look after their own training because as we're moving more and more towards a contingent workforce, uh, short-term contract workers, uh, you know, project-based workers, uh, people not on long-term uh, employment as, and part-time workers and the like, I think we need more individuals to take responsibility for their own training as well. I don't think we get enough of that. that that's something I definitely endorse. I think it's something that we're, we're seeing more and more is that um, the 70, 20, 10, that sort of 70% of what you learn is, is on the job and only 10% of it is in a classroom. And I think people really need to, to grasp that idea. So employees need to be very aware that 
they are very much responsible for learning and developing their skills. I'm also sort of, I think, 36, for only 36% of people to have identified that they need to retrain to keep pace with changes is, is an underestimation, of, I think, of how quickly things are going to, to change um, in this talent-driven economy that we're seeing. So I do think it's, it's them recognizing that they might have the skills they need to do their job today, but how do they go about developing the skills they need for the future? Maybe HR departments ought to think about having kind of budgets so uh, that individuals can get training budgets themselves so they can use it to help develop their own skills in conjunction with their line manager. I think the old days of HR saying, here are the training courses available to you, I mean, that's fine up to a point. Individuals may say, well, you know what I need? I need X, Y, and Z. And we need them to be able to either go to HR and get some budgets to go outside the organization and get training on, on tasks they need. We have to really think more cleverly now about how we – uh, train and develop individuals and enable them to, hack, to participate in this and look at where their skill deficits are or where they think the skills are going to need for the next year or two is go, are going to be and maybe not always have to, if they had their own kind of training budgets themselves, um, maybe line managers having them, uh, then individuals can go get training outside the organization in areas they need help in. Yeah, I like that idea good way of approaching it and I think it's making them accountable so they don't turn around and say uh, you know HR didn't tell me that my job my skills were becoming obsolete they HR should enable them and help them but it's very much about employees taking accountability okay thanks Annabelle uh, moving on to technology now um, obviously we all know the way we work has changed technology has transformed the pattern of working life and employees are well aware of the influence technology yields at work. 72% of employees report that technology has changed their role or career over the last 12 months, a huge jump from 45% just a year ago. Um, and it's interesting that today only 34% of employees do not have an employee-provided mobile, smartphone, tablet, or laptop. Technology has allowed more of us to work flexibly, but of course this brings its own challenges. 28% of employees feel that the lines between personal and work life are becoming more blurred, up from 16% last year. Clearly, technology has a great capacity to work in HR's favor in engaging employees, so what can HR do to maximize its effect without further blurring of the boundaries? Uh, I think what, one thing that worries me is, and I'm seeing from a kind of well-being stress point of view, is the uh, the blurring of the boundaries, really, where technology is managing us and we're not managing it. We're always going to need technology. It's here to stay, and there's no problem, no no question of that. And the increase just from 45% to 72% say that technology has changed their role or career. That's a dramatic increase just in one year alone. But my worry is that it's all too pervasive. I mean, it's influencing our private life. People need, you know, are working longer. They're working harder. There are fewer people in the work environment who have more work on their plate than ever before. So the work-life balance issue has become imbalanced, and technology is beginning to intrude in our personal and private life. Now, it shows an increase here from 16 to 28 percent. Uh, saying the lines are being blurred. I suspect if we do this next year, you're going to go over 50% on that because I think what's happening is it's, it, you know, where people are doing emails while they're on holiday, they're doing, uh, they're doing their work at home, uh, they're uh, accessing their smartphones. Somehow we have to kind of manage that process because, in my view, if you look at our productivity per capita in the U.K., if you look at the G8, we're seventh. Uh, in fact, I'm sorry, the, of the G7, we're seventh. And um, and that's not good enough. And I think our productivity is suffering, in a sense, uh, by technology interfering with our R and R time, it's re and our, our our relationships at home. Because that's what makes you more resilient. The things you do outside when you finish work makes you come back into the work environment slightly refreshed. But if you're constantly working all the time because technology is pushing you in that direction, it's not good news. I agree with that, and I think it's a cultural position. I think it's very much up to the leadership of the company to set their expectations and to manage that. Um, I would, however, say that I think that technology, if it's used responsibly, um, can actually help with the work-life balance. Um, as a working mum myself, um, I can go home and put my daughter to bed 
um, rather than stay in the office. Um, a few years ago, there would have been more pressure for me to stay in the office longer rather than have that valuable time at home. So I do think if it's used responsibly, um, it, can, it can actually support um, a work-life balance. But I think there is a cultural management bit that is very critical um, to the, that is down to the management of the business. The other, my other observation on the technology side is, is this: the 45% of employees reporting that technology has changed their role. What we don't think about here is, is the, whether that's a positive or a negative change. Um, so for some people, technology might actually be making their job easier. So the systems that we're providing, I'm thinking in HR, for example, um, the systems that we uh, as a business provide people in HR to do their job um, may actually be making life easier to free up their time to do other more value-added um, things. Um, as well as obviously the technology that enables flexibility. Yeah, I think Annabelle's right. I think, uh, you know, technology can be great if we use it properly, and it certainly will help work-life balance if people are allowed to use technology working partly from home, partly from a central office. That's going to be really great. But if we have people still in central offices, if we're not using it properly, and then they go home and start to do more work. That, that becomes kind of problematic. And we're finding more and more firms managing it. Some big, big city firms, brand names are now telling their employees, you are not to access your, mobile, uh, your uh, smartphone uh, you know, over the weekend, that that's just persona non grata unless it's something quite critical. That's good. I think we just need some guidelines here. But certainly technology is here to stay. It can help us and help us with good balance and help us uh, technologically in the jobs we do, but we just just keep a watching brief, I think. Okay, thanks, Kerry. Um, moving on now, the survey, um, the same as last year, actually, also featured questions specifically aimed at HRDs to try and gain their perspective and discover how and where HR is driving the people agenda. So as employees become more positive about the outlook for the world at work, HRDs are faced with a challenging task of balancing those employee demands. The notion of HR as a strategic business function has been around for a while now and is widely accepted. So HR really do have the power to position organizations to meet the critical people challenges of the 21st century. In that context, HRD see their priorities as shown on this graph. Um, and I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone to see talent management at the number one spot again, closely followed by succession planning. Clearly, HRDs are thinking about the sustainability of their organizations an observation supported by the high ranking given to succession planning. So what do you see as the main concern specifically for HRDs around talent and succession? Well, I mean, I think they're, they're quite important. I mean, it's not funny enough, it's not just HRDs, the employees themselves see it. So, I mean, I think that's really important. What I'd like to see myself is less of a concern with employee engagement per se. I mean, I see that's ranked, I think, third, isn't it? And really... I'm not quite sure that's something that we should be devoting. Our, we, I think what HR has done is for too long employee engagement has been this magic bullet. I think the real magic bullet should be the kind of well-being agenda of which employee engagement is one part of that, managing stress is another part of that, flexible working. In other words, I'd like to see a culture produced where people actually enjoy coming to work, where work becomes more fun we spend more of our waking hours at work than we do at home with our families. So I'd like to see more of that. Uh, HRDs for sure are going to always be in the talent, talent business, and they should be in succession planning and the, and the like. They're really, really important. But there's a whole load of other issues that I would say are cultural issues about, you know, is this a nice, is this a good place to work? Do I want to be here? Is it fun? Are my colleagues supportive? Are we, are we on the same team here? Um, do they do they value me? Do they look after my health? Do they care about what impact this um, this job is having on me and my family? I think that's how you retain people. And if we're talking about talent management, it's just not about getting the best talent. It's also, as one HR director told me not too long ago, it's about uh, uh, make, ensuring that you kind of retain people. Um, and so I think, uh, and, and the expression he used was regrettable turnover. What I'm more worried about is people leaving this place who are fundamental to the business because we don't look after them. Uh, I think that's a very valuable um, message as well because I think it's some of these initiatives will drive the employee engagement, but rather than focusing just on that, on engagement, I think it's important to break it down into what makes people want to come to work. Um, what is it about the experience of their day-to-day -day life that 
wants them to be here, wants them to go and tell their friends that this is a great company to work for, um, that spreads the word about life at, you know, within their organisation. So I do think it's really important to, to focus on all of those areas. I thought there was something really interesting. I went to a, a, a conference in the city. I had to give a talk in, uh, on a panel there. And there was a Swedish bank, who the only bank in the city not to give bonuses. And you know why? And what they do, and I find this phenomenal, what they do is they recruit people, and they spend a lot of time to recruit the people whose value systems match their value systems. And then you know what they do? They give them a bonus when they hit 65. They don't give them a bonus, one bonus, and for all the years they're working with them. And that's to retain them, that's to value them, and they create the most unbelievable working environment. Yet the other banks are every year trying to outplay uh, one another by giving bonuses every year. And, and this is quite a different way of, of looking. It's a, it's a culture change, and I like to see that kind of happen more and more. Yeah, and the other observation on this is that I think the talent are going to expect a different experience as the years go by. So they're looking for something more, um, something intangible, really, that and, and for us to retain them and to attract them, to have that employer brand. It's not about who pays the most. Um, it's about who lives the values that you live. Um, so that's, I think that's a really interesting concept, the idea of the you know, long, long-term retention bonuses rather than a, yeah, what do we do? It's a sort of like this, almost a panic with everybody's trying to price us out of the market. Quick, let's, let's throw some more money at the problem rather than actually thinking about things that are going to build a long-term commitment. Which I think we're going to get more and more of in, in a sense that we're going to give more and more John Lewis partnership type models where people are a part of the business and feel part of the business and get rewarded as a part of the business in the long term. Okay, so um, Kerry and Annabelle have already talked a little bit about employee engagement, um, which um, ha did come next on the HRD priority for the next year, um, and that's obviously not surprising given how vital it is to performance and retention. Um, when asked to rank the factors they believe motivate employees, 70% of HRD said that um, praise and recognition is a chief motivator, so um, much higher than the 30% of employees, which I think is an important difference. So is there anything else you want to add about how, what the best ways are for HRD to address employee engagement issues? Well, for me, I think it uh, goes beyond employee engagement. You know, it's a, think about going to work, all of us thinking about when we go to work. Uh, part of what we, why we go to uh, one of the things we value in the workplace is somebody engaging us in the decision making that's going to affect our job, or even the decision making that could affect your team or the, the organization as a whole, and that you want to feel there's good communication by your line manager and other senior management. That kind of engagement is important, but you also want good colleagueship, you want cooperation, you want uh, good flexible working, you want a whole range of things that and you want to feel valued you want to feel trusted uh and so i i think it's got to be broader than engagement and it's not we've got into this thing it's a become a tick box exercise employee engagement and uh, and it really in my talking to hrds they tell me they think it's it's time has gone as a sole magic bullet it is not a silver bullet any longer there's a broader thing called well-being how this, this organization treats me as a human being. And I think that's somehow what we have to think more about. As we can see, look at the factors that have come up high from employees uh, working flexibly, for example, because they have outside issues. And as long as they're allowed to engage and try to fulfill all their obligations, uh, they're going to perform better for you. My other observation of this is that we are approaching five generations in the workforce now, and each generation has a very different trigger, um, have a different expectation and different things that are going to engage them. So I think, again, it's something we need to be very aware of, that there isn't one answer that suits all. So, you know, when it talks on here about 50% um, for pensions, you know, that, that's very valid, but I wonder if you actually broke that down and looked at the different generations in the workforce, if that would always be the same. Okay, thanks, Annabelle. Um, we've already talked a little bit about technology and the impact that's having on the workplace as well. Um, employees are obviously feeling the effects of 72% saying they believe technology has changed the way they work. 
But what kind of impact is, in, is technology having on HRDs? 67% uh, say that technology has changed the way they communicate with the workforce. 20% say that technology enables better communication. And 15% believe it increases two-way communication um, you know, with the effect that it gives their team a better understanding of employee and views. So, you know, and as we've said before, technology isn't going anyway, anywhere. Um, you know, we've already got the next wave of devices in the pipeline, thinking about wearable technology, smart connected devices, and so on. So how will HR manage this continuous drive of new technology, and do you think it will continue to be such a strong motivator? Well, I was quite surprised to see that 20% say technology enables better collaboration. That's quite a small proportion. I was quite surprised to see that, but I guess it depends what kind of technologies you're using, doesn't it? When you say technology, it could be just about anything. I think maybe what's in there, uh, what underpins that is the concern maybe that what's ending up happening is that technology maybe uh, is making people work in silos rather than together. Like there are a lot of companies out there now saying you cannot use emails within the same office building. You know, you have to actually go talk to your colleagues, which I think is really quite important. It's about how we manage the technology. It's going to be good for us. I mean, technology will, could help us, but it also could stop. I mean, you can go into just about any office now, any open plan office, and you could drop a pin in it. And you wouldn't hear it. You could, you could drop a bomb in it. You wouldn't hear it because you know why? People are actually on their screens rather than talking to one another. So technology is useful, important, will be there forever and will improve and, and do this, that, and the other. But we have to manage it rather than it manage us. And I get very worried about people emailing people in the same building and, and that not being a way in which we could bring teams together. And I guess HR must have the same concerns as well. But it's how you use it. It's how you manage it. And it, that's up to HR to decide how we can get the most out of human beings who like eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball communication in the long run. Yeah, I think it's about balance. I think you're right, and it's about uh, you know, using it in the right way and using it responsibly, not relying on it completely. Uh, I was having a conversation recently about um, e-learning content, and you know, think it's fantastic. Let's let's put more more learning opportunities online, make them very interactive. But that's not going to suit everybody, and it's not going to be the answer for everything. There's still going to need to be that instructor-led classroom training for certain topics or certain people are going to learn better that way and I think we have to be very aware that um, that we don't overuse technology and we make sure we get that balance right. And I think the other thing, Annabelle, that worries me is that HR should be very worried and concerned about using technology to communicate to their employees negative messages. In other words, you're going to lose your job, there's going to be a major reorganization. We have to be very careful in communicating with employees, and HR in particular has to be careful not to use social media, not to use technology in communicating difficult situations and major change. Mm. No, you're right, and you know, there have been some, some worrying examples over the last few years of when people, companies have got that wrong. Um, and I think, yeah, you're right, well, HR needs to be very cognizant of that. Okay, so thanks to both uh, Kerry and Annabelle. I think we've had some really interesting comments there. Um, I'm going to move on to some questions now that we've had coming in from attendees. So the first one is, um, is there a danger to that those not designated as talent within organizations, so those who are not designated as high performing or with leadership potential, end up feeling demotivated and even disengaged by the talent management strategy? And how um, do HR manage this? Oh, that's a very good question. But, you know, talent management is managing everybody. Why? I mean, I, it's almost by implication, that question, that talent management is about senior managers. It shouldn't just be about senior management. Everybody in the organization can uh, develop and learn in, in, their, in their way and get ahead in, in various ways, no matter where they are in the organization. So if we're only thinking about talent management at, for senior people, I think we're making a big, big mistake. A lot of what gets done in organizations gets done at the coalface. So when we think about how do we develop our talent, how do we retain them, it should be about everybody in the organization, not just about the people at the top. And, and I would agree with that. I see the, you know, the talent management being about everyone in the company and everybody who has the potential to work for the company. Um, and it's about developing those people who, who have the desire to be developed. I think there has got to be a desire. 
so you know if they, and, and making sure that those people who may not be high potential high performing employees how do we get them there so what programs do we put in place um, to help develop them okay thanks Annabelle um, the next one is um, I recently read another survey that suggested the numbers of men showing an interest in taking shared parental leave to be as high as 62 percent your survey cites figures of 33 percent of um, 25 to 34 year olds Surely, in the end, it will boil down to what the, the pay looks like, whether it's enhanced by employers like maternity pay, for example, and who can best afford to stay home. Yeah, I think we've always had a problem in the whole area of flexible working or shared parental leave or whatever, that women know the necessity of doing that and understand it. Come on, they're having the children, right? They understand that. And men are very worried. I did a big study where I looked at flexible working, uh, in a huge grant to try to find out why men don't apply as often as women and significantly don't apply often as women. And by the way, when they do apply, they tend to get rejected at a significantly higher rate than, than women. And I, we, we're trying to find out why, and we did it in a big, huge public sector body and a big, huge private sector body. And we found out that reason, basically men were saying that I get worried that this will adversely affect my career. Women don't say that, but men do say that because women, of course, want to have a family life as well and they see that as a part of their kind of uh, a role in in society generally and so i think we have an issue here i don't think it's just about the money i think men have to feel that their career won't be adversely affected if they take shared parental leave i think it's more about that than anything but I, i'd be, like to hear annabelle on this i think i made point earlier as well about the balance of pay now that um it's not unusual now for the woman to earn more than the man. We shouldn't assume that that's, um, it's always the reverse of that. And therefore, I think there's a big decision for a couple to make at this point about who, who goes back to work first, who brings in that money. Um, but I also think there, are very, there is a very traditional mindset. So agreeing with you there, I think, in terms of the mindset of such traditional, long-established family values that the mother stays home and brings up the children. Um, and I think it's... I think initiatives like this will start to change that but it, I think it's going to take time so the 60 whatever percent it was in another survey yeah we might see that but I don't think it's going to happen in year one yeah I think this survey which shows about a third is probably much more accurate Annabelle than the 60% that that that, that uh, uh, listener uh, mentions um, and, and I think it's uh, it really important to understand this the more research we do to see what the impact is by the way in the medium to long term when people do take it so in the study I did with colleagues at uh, Caroline Gattrell and other colleagues and working families because we did a big study on, on flexible working men who take up flexible working are more productive more job satisfied and have take less days off in the long term so the the more we have the data that shows men sharing parental leave actually has a business benefit, the better. And we will find that. Okay, thanks, Kerry. Um, moving on to the next one. Um, is it HR's responsibility to set up development plans for their employees? Um, you talked a bit earlier about the worry of employees being complacent about their need to retrain. But is it down to the employee or is it down to HR? Well, I think it's a bit of both, isn't it? I mean, it's 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 the employee with HR thinking about where they have to go in the future, but it's individuals as well. Because, you know, jobs are no longer for life, and I hate saying this, HR people, but you're not going to have an employee there for 50 years or 40 years or 30 years like they used to two decades ago. They're just not. They're going to be in – I have a, uh, a daughter who was a, was a marketing director, and she's 38 uh, years of age at the moment, and she's been in at least a dozen jobs. So the future for the Y Gen people is constant, you know, constant movement. Unfortunately, and or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, and therefore they have to look after their own training and think about their own development, not to rely just on HR. But HR has a responsibility to make sure that they're trained to do the job when they're working for them, at least. So it's a combination of both, in my view. Yeah, I think I think you're right there. I think it is HR and the business, so and managers identifying what the needs are for the business for the to get the job done and to benefit the business um, and make those opportunities available for employees. Um, but I think as far as career development goes, um, I think yeah, employees should be thinking bigger picture. 
Okay, thanks, Annabelle. Um, the next one is uh, you talked about technology devices being provided to employees and the increased blurring of work and personal life. But what about social media? Do you think there's a danger that it that social media can exacerbate this blurring further? And is it HR's responsibility to police this? Uh, do you mean social media, people using Twitter and, and that uh, to do with work or just personally and that adversely affecting work? I guess it must mean a bit of both, doesn't it? I think, I think probably a bit of both, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it is a danger, isn't it? I mean, because Twitter is so easy. And companies are encouraging their employees uh, to use it to some extent, which is bi business-related use it. Uh, uh, but, of course, you get off on a tangent, don't you? You can say political things on there. You can say very un-PC things, as we've seen. It is I, I just – it's guidelines, isn't it, to people? giving them guidelines. If you're going to do this and you're going to tweet uh, stuff to do with the business, ensure that you have a separate account if you want to do something that's for private. It's things like that. I, I, mean, I, think, I think it would be useful for businesses to, to think about this because social media is not going away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, you're right. Guidelines and, dare I say it, a bit of common sense. Okay. Absolutely, thanks, yeah. Okay, so um, what if we put curfews in place for using work technology outside of work hours and employees ignore them? What if they want to work in the evenings and at weekends or feel like they need to in order to fulfill their job function? Should HR be trying to educate employees with well-being initiatives? Oh, very interesting indeed. Yeah, I did a big um, a study for uh, a television company. We did a, a program, a half an hour program, where what we actually did went into a company. And what we did is we, uh, the CEO wanted this, and it was an experiment. And we had everybody, they couldn't take their mobile phone, they couldn't access any computer, their smartphone, anything, for a whole week at home. As soon as they left at 5 o'clock, that was it. They couldn't do anything. And, by the way, in the office during the 9 to 5, well, it was actually about 9 to 6, uh, they couldn't send emails to anybody on any of the floors. They had to actually go talk to them and give them, and, 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 and they couldn't send them emails. It all, all had to be done in the same building. Only emails could be sent outside the building, but not in. And you could see a dramatic, um, absolutely dramatic impact. And the families then were studied, i.e. the kids and the, and, the, and the wife and husband at home said that, the, the communication systems massively improved as a consequence of that. I think we have to manage this because we need people to come back refreshed in, in, in the environment. We need them to come back. And, yes, there are people who want to work all the time. And if they have no social commitments, they have no family, they have no kids, they're basically workaholics, fine. If they want to work at night and bump themselves off, it's fine. But to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think it's good for the business aside from the family because if you – come home and you're constantly working on your computer and doing things and you're not engaging with your kids and everything else, you're going to create family problems, which is going to then ultimately affect you in the workplace. So it's about getting that kind of balance right. Uh, otherwise, I think we have difficulties. And yes, we shouldn't say you shouldn't do this. You can't do this. I think we should just educate them and say, look, it, we need you to rest. When you go on holiday, we don't ex anticipate you should work 70% of the time or take your computer with you. You know, if we want you and there's an emergency and the office is burning down, we will definitely call you. Yeah, I, I'm fully in support of that. I think there's, um, and that's I can't point I made earlier about the cultural um, piece, that I think it comes from senior leadership to set the example. And, um, you know, if they're on holiday, they're on holiday. And so that there isn't an expectation that everyone else has to also be online when they're on holiday. Um, the other thing I would say is that if people are finding that if we said to them, you can't work in the evenings and then the stress levels build because they're anxious, they can't keep on top of things, then we need to look at the root cause. Why are they not keeping on top of things? Is it, are they under-resourced? Are they not coping? Is it a learning need? So I do think if it's a, you know, if people are constantly having to work from home, then there's some underlying problem with the structure of their role or their capability within that role that we need to be cognizant of. I think Annabelle makes an extremely important point. If consistently somebody is having to work at home every night, having to work on holidays, something is wrong with the way in which they're doing their job. They're not prioritizing their job properly or whatever. Uh, we recently just, I'm doing a big study with a, a guy in one of the major police forces, uh, and uh, he, we've, we've uh, determined that quite a lot of the police and a lot of people in the public sector are actually suffering from not presenteeism, but what I call leaveism. 
that what they're tending to do is because they're not managing the nature of their job, that when they go on leave, they take leave to actually carry on the work they unable to do uh, during, the, uh, during the week. So what Annabelle is saying is really important. If somebody consistently needs to work at night, something is wrong with that person. They're not prioritizing their work, and they're not going to need some help. Otherwise, they will burn out. Okay, thanks, Kerry. And I'm um, sorry, but that's going to have to be the last question. Any that you've sent through that haven't been answered um, will be answered by Kerry, Kerry and Annabelle and emailed to you. Uh, if you're attending live, you'll receive your copy of Kerry's latest book, Solving the Strategy, strategy Delusion, shortly. I think it's published next week. Is that right, Kerry? Yes, it's published next week. That's right. Brilliant. Paul Grave okay. McMillan. Okay, thanks. So thank you again to Kerry and Annabelle for being such great speakers today, and thanks to all of you for attending. For information on, on any more upcoming events, please visit adp.co.uk forward slash events or email me at karen.brett at adp.com. So thank you and um, bye.